Hello everybody, Julian Charles here of TheMindRenewed.com, coming to you from the depths of the Lancashire countryside here in the UK. Today is the 18th of May 2017, and I'm very pleased to welcome to the programme Dr. Robert J. Marks II, who is Distinguished Professor of Engineering at Baylor University. Dr. Marks's eponymous honours include, and I wonder if I can pronounce these correctly, but I'll have a go, the Zhao Atlas Marks Time Frequency Distribution in the Field of Signal Processing, the Chung Marks Marx theorem in Shannon sampling theory and the Papoulis Marx Chung approach in multidimensional sampling. I'm sure Dr. Marx will correct me if I got any of those wrong in a minute. Um, he was instrumental in defining the field of computational intelligence and with his colleagues developed the temporal convolutional neural network widely used in deep learning. In 2008, Dr. Marx appeared in the documentary movie Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed, starring Ben Stein, and in 2013 he was listed among the most, the 50 most influential scientists in the world today by thebestschools.org. A Christian since 1970, Dr. Marx served for 17 years as the faculty advisor to Campus Crusade for Christ at the University of Washington. He is also married with three children, three grandchildren, two dogs, and very importantly, a stupid horse. <laughs> Dr. Marx, thank you very much for joining us on the program. Oh, thank you. It's an honor. It's uh, it's a great honor to be a part of your uh, series of broadcasts. That's very good of you to say so. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and I'm glad you told me about the stupid horse, but I should think that most people are thinking to themselves, well, I'm not sure I want to listen to the rest of the interview until I know about the stupid horse. So could you tell us? <laughs> well, the, yeah, the stupid horse. You know, every little girl wants a pony. And so as my wife um, matured and we could afford one, she got her dream. And she bought a horse, which just stands out in the field and eats my hay all day. And and sometimes I feel like a horse butler. I have to go and uh, attend to uh, all of the needs of the horse and say, uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, I'm glad to clean your stall, anything else that you need. So I, I have a very low opinion of the horse. But my wife loves it. and I love my wife. So it stays. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I wish you'd told me that before, that you're a horse butler, because I would love to have introduced you in that way. That would have been, that would have been wonderful. <laughs> yes, um, I have to put that on my resume, actually. Please do. Um, well, of course, we're going to be discussing today your new book, uh, which I believe is published this month. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. It came out uh, in the early part of May. Yes. Great. And it's called Introduction to Evolutionary Informatics, which you co-authored with the mathematician and philosopher William Dembski and the research scientist and software engineer Winston Ewart. Now, I think <laughs> the term evolutionary informatics will probably be a bit of a mystery to many listeners. Of course, I've had the benefit of reading your book in advance, but for the sake of those who haven't come across terminology like that before, perhaps you could give us a brief description of what this book is about and what you've sought to establish through it, essentially. Well, let's see. I think that the main premise in so far as evolution is that there exists no hard science model of neo-Darwinian evolution. And I don't think there'll ever be, but I think in science you never say never because uh, you never know what's going to come down the tracks. But I can say definitively that there currently exists no such model. And the way this is established is through, uh, number one, defining what you mean by information theory. Number two, looking at the attempts by the, let me call them neo-Darwinists, to establish uh, evolution via models and via computer programs and why those are a failure in, in terms of uh, undirected neo-Darwinian search. Mm -hmm. And you also have a section in the book on artificial intelligence saying something along the lines of however powerful that may become, it will never rise to the heights of human creativity. Is that right? Yes, that's exactly right. Uh, the human mind is above and beyond a computer and much of the hype that goes on today about computers gaining consciousness, like in the Terminator when Skynet gained consciousness and began to kill everybody on the earth, that isn't applicable. And how do you determine that? When you're thinking about things, you always have to go back to the fundamentals. And so if one goes back to the fundamentals of computers and computer science, I think that many of these conclusions about the limitation of the computer um, just fall out very naturally. Mm -hmm. 
though Terminator 2 yeah. is an excellent film, you must admit, even though it is pure science fiction from your point of view. Oh, absolutely. It's uh, <laughs> Love Arnold. And How he ever came to be an actor, I have no idea, but uh, he does a good I, job. I have no idea, but many times I excuse myself from meetings and I, I walk to the door and turn around and say, I'll be Bach. So <laughs> I, I quote the Terminator quite often. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so that's what we're going to be discussing. But I would first of all like to get a little more of uh, an idea about your background, Dr. Marx. Could you tell us a bit more about your work and uh, perhaps most importantly for this podcast anyway, the relationship between the science you do and the Christian faith that you hold? Well, yes, I, I became a Christian. I came to Christ when I was a junior in college. And it was a um, it was a life changing experience for me and one that I've always been thankful to our Lord that um, that possibility exists. I have never had a problem with the intersection of science and faith. In fact, I think that having the intersection of science and faith allows one to actually explore a broader realm of solutions than if one just adheres to uh, total materialism or naturalism. Mm. So therefore, the arena of solutions that one has is much broader. And I believe that in searching for the truth that There are things which exist outside of uh, modeling, which exist outside of our understanding. That's that's a topic for why the human mind will never become a computer, because there are things that we can prove that um, are not computable. In fact, we can prove things that are unknowable. We can prove they exist. And we can also prove that they're unknowable, just just astonishing. But I'm not the only one. If one looks into history at all of the great scientists, uh, mostly from Western Europe, that founded science as we know it today, many of them were Christians. And I think of uh, Louis Pasteur, he says, the more I study nature, the more I stand amazed at the work of the creator. Into his tiniest creatures, God has placed extraordinary properties. And so people like Pasteur and other ones uh, recognize the creation of God around them and have celebrated it. I, I'm kind of a nerd, uh, and I see God in things that other people don't see. My wife will look at a, a beautiful meadow of flowers. And she said, oh, that's so beautiful. I see God. And I look out and I see a meadow full of flowers. But if <laughs> if you give me uh, some good science or some mind-bending mathematics, my response is immediately, I see God in this. And one day I hope wow. to write a book on mathematical apologetics. I know it'll be a bestseller, but uh, for, all the, for all the nerds in the world that see uh, God in his creation, I think it might be a big hit. That's very interesting, because that connects with some of the things that James Sire was saying on this show, uh, where he was saying, you know, some of the things that we see in reality are kind of like a creative, divine artwork that's presented to us, and we can just get the presence of the creator through that. So, in a sense, what you're saying there seems to reflect that kind of approach to apologetics, an immediate experience. Yes, and I believe everybody has different colored glasses. Different people see God in his creation in different aspects. My wife likes the metal of flowers. I like the math and science. Well, I think I'm probably with your wife on that one. I can't, can't <laughs> okay. imagine seeing a page of mathematics and seeing God in that. But anyway, oh. you say, it's a very, a very, <laughs> very personal thing. Um, so now, what a lot of people, I think, would say, having heard you there, I mean, the very fact that you talked about um, your faith opening up lots of possibilities for solutions that perhaps a materialist wouldn't see, is that your faith is influencing your science. But a lot of people would say, ah, oh, well, therefore, that's a bad thing. You're not doing pure science. You're doing faith plus science. Well, let me tell you that one's ideology, if one is is searching for truth, uh, one's ideology will ultimately not be a factor in that. Let me give you an example. Alan Turing, who you're familiar with, I'm sure. He was he was British. Uh, he he decoded the Enigma code. They made a movie about him, yes. the uh, the Imitation Game. Yeah, but yeah. that that was not the big thing he did. He actually uh, started computer science. Now, it was well known, of course, that Alan Turing was was gay and that led because of his unfortunate uh, persecution to his suicide. Mm. But the man was a genius because he founded computer science prior to computers existing. He did it on paper. And all of the computers we have today can be traced as generalizations, not, not even generalizations, special cases of the Turing machine. In other words, the big computers we have today, you can do stuff on them, but you can also do it on Turing's original machine. 
So we haven't got better. We've simply gotten faster, if you will. But what was Turing's motivation for doing this? When he was in high school, he had a friend die of bovine tuberculosis. And this led him to doubts in God. And so, therefore, one of his motivations for finding computer science was to show that we were machines. And ultimately, even though he had this ideology, Turing's work has led to the conclusions which we talk about at the end of the book, uh, such as the mind is greater than the computer. So even though he had a specific ideology, his pursuance of truth um, led to a result contrary to his initial purpose. And I believe that that's also the case with uh, intelligent design uh, sort of work, that eventually the truth is going to win out, and it doesn't matter the ideology of the, uh, the, that drives the research, if you will. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. And of course, uh, looking back at history, you were saying about famous scientists from the past who have been Christians, you would have to write off all their work, wouldn't you, as a consequence of that kind of criticism. So I, I, I agree with you. Yes, it doesn't really matter what your motivation is, so long as you're geared towards finding truth as the answer. And I think that in debate, that's referred to as something like the genetic fallacy, yeah. which is one doesn't deal with what is proposed, but one points to the person and says, well, that can't be right because you're stupid. Now, you, you mentioned intelligent design there. That's often conflated in the media with creationism, by which I think they usually mean theories guided by scriptural interpretation, um, primarily guided by scripture. Um, how would you distinguish intelligent design from that kind of creationism? Well, creationism, as I understand it, looks at Genesis and attempts to uh, make sure that all the history and the science conforms to Genesis. Those involved in intelligent design, on the other hand, believe that indeed that as we pursue truth, that we are going to find things which are consistent with the Christian faith. And if they're not consistent with the Christian faith, well, you know, maybe we have a problem there. Mm. That, I think, is the big difference, that we are actually looking at truth, believing that if our faith is true, that anything we discover is going to be consistent with that faith. Um, now, Stephen Meyer says that intelligent design does not commit the God of the gaps fallacy, uh, where you have a gap in theory and you say, oh, well, we don't understand that, therefore that must be caused by God. But he says that intelligent design really argues from what we do know about design in ordinary life. Do you agree that it's arguing from what we do know rather than being a God of the gaps fallacy? Yes, I, I believe that the complexity that we observe around us just in daily experience cannot be explained by a, uh, a blind search, a blind Darwinian sort of process. Mm -hmm. So yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to be looking at these uh, evolutionary models that are out there in a little while. But what I, well, before we start that, I want to ask you a basic kind of question in your approach to this. Um, am I right in thinking you're not saying that evolution does not happen and has not happened, but rather you are critiquing the models that are out there and saying that they are essentially not up to the job. Exactly. I'm looking at the models which have been proposed by the neo-Darwinists, and uh, we're analyzing those and showing that they won't hold water. Okay, good. So we'll turn to the book then. And the first thing that I want to say about this is that I enjoyed the book very much. I think it's an extremely interesting book. But I have to say, it's, I don't think it's easy. Um, and I can see that you've aimed it at the non-specialist, of course. But I think it's true to say that it still does require a fairly high level of mathematical literacy, at least by high school standards anyway, to get the most from it. On the other hand, you do provide many descriptions and illustrations to help people like me, you know, who have rather distant memories of our high school maths, um, to get the gist of what's being said. So I think I certainly think it is a very rewarding book, but not always easy. Do you think that you have got the balance right? Um that's that's always a, that's always a good question. I think uh, Einstein said, "Explain things as simple as possible, but but not simpler." So I, we, we, we've attempted to do that in the book, but uh, can it be made uh, more simpler and more accessible? Yes, I think it can, but that's going to take some head scratching and some thinking of ways to do things. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't envy you the task. I just wondered if you could have done what Michael Behe did with his book, Darwin's Black Box, and actually box off some of the more technical sections. Though I know in a sense you did do that in, in the text. You said you know, people could skip the next couple of pages, but he actually did box them off. I wonder whether that would have been a way to go with that. 
Well, I we didn't box them off, but we did put little uh, daggers by all of the places that could be skipped that uh, got kind of, you know, nerdy and mathematical. So there are entire sections. There are footnotes with little daggers by them that said, you can skip this. Okay. And I think we actually maybe mentioned that we were uh, motivated by Behe's book I to try to do that. I think it might have been that I had an earlier copy. So maybe that was, you added that later, did you? Yes, ah, that could have that been. Explains yes. everything. But currently in the in-print uh, version, everything's daggered off. And I did this because when I read Behe's Black Box, I'm not a biochemist. I'm, I'm an engineer. And I wasn't following some of the uh, details, some of the technical details. And him doing that really helped me to understand the book without getting into the nitty gritty details. So we were motivated by that in the book yeah. to do exactly the same thing. Excellent. So as I say, I've got a pre-publication copy without that. So that explains it. Um, okay. So I want to ask you about the legitimacy of your project itself here, because you are applying principles of information theory, which we'll get into in, in a minute, very mathematical stuff to these current models of evolution to see if those models stand up. But some people, I'm sure, would say that's basically not legitimate. You you can't model biological evolution on computers. It's too complex to be modeled. What do you say to that? Well, I say if somebody says that uh, evolution is too complex to be modeled, then they would be agreeing with the premise there exists no hard science model of neo-Darwinian evolution. So they're actually agreeing with me. I think that the uh, underlying reason is a little bit different, but uh, they're agreeing that there exists no model. And therefore, the Darwinian sort of evolution itself is not a hard science. So you're saying that in order to be a hard science, it must be capable of mathematical modeling. Yes, and many things in biology are modeled that way. Uh, I, I have a colleague here, uh, Keith Schubert, that's doing extreme life. He goes down in sulfur caves and looks at life uh, in these extreme cases, and he's using a finite automata in order to model that. In history, there's uh, the Lotka Volterra predator prey equations, there's mathematical epidemiology, uh, all sorts of modeling in biology. Yeah. Every hard science has a model which is mathematical outside of biology electromagnetics you have something called maxwell's equations mechanics is is modeled by newtonian laws uh, quantum theory by by schrodinger's equation etc cetera, etc cetera. so all of the hard sciences have mathematics at their foundation and even soft sciences like finance mm -hmm. use sophisticated models that uh, literally win nobel prizes one of the um, great mathematicians of my generation, one of the greatest and most creative, uh, Gregory Chaitin, who, by the way, gave a review of our book, which is kind of cool. He said, the honor of mathematics requires us to come up with a mathematical theory of evolution and either prove that Darwin was wrong or right. And that's something that I agree with. And I think in this book, we have shown that the neo-Darwinian model does not exist. I don't think it will ever exist. Well, as much as I can understand of the book, you do seem to make a very compelling case. I have to say that. I can imagine, however, somebody coming back to you and saying, but you're not a biologist, you're an engineer, so how can you be well-placed to look at this problem? Well, one of the things, again, and that's exactly right, I am not a biologist, I am an engineer, but engineers you know, we're different than scientists because scientists kind of uh, celebrate their models and they place them up on thrones like a queen and they worship them. And engineers, on the other hand, make the queen come down and scrub the floor. And if she doesn't work, we fire her. And so that is a big difference. Now, in evolution, evolution has been a part of engineering ever since the advent of the computer. In fact, in the 60s and 70s, people were saying we can't wait to get fast computers because we aren't able to show in the laboratory the process of Darwinian evolution because it is so daggone slow. And so they said, let's get some computer programs going to show that uh, Darwinian evolution works. Now, engineers have taken evolution, and we have actually applied it to some very interesting things. Uh, NASA scientists, for example, used evolutionary computation. There's actually a whole field in engineering called evolutionary computation, and they have designed an antenna which is flying around in space right now. So they, they evolved this using a, a computer program. My first paper that had to do with evolution was over, I believe, 22 years ago. And I was administratively part of founding the premier evolutionary computing journal, the IEEE Transactions on Evolutionary Theory. 
So, yes, I'm not a biologist, but I do know the modeling and I do know the theory of, uh, of evolution. And that's what we've been applying here. OK. And you brought up that business about the NASA antenna that had been produced, as you say, by an evolutionary program, which would suggest, just looking at the surface of this, that, well, yes, evolutionary algorithms do, in fact, work. So it proves neo-Darwinism. But of course, you are critiquing those very processes themselves and finding that they need to have informational input beyond what we normally think of evolutionary processes. So we'll come back to that NASA example in a few minutes. Now, if we're going to use, as you do, information theory to assess these models, of biological evolution. I think we need to have some basic idea of what information theory is. Um, so could you give us a basic kind of definition of what that is? That's an excellent question, because anytime one talks about evolution or, or information, one needs to get definitions before one proceeds. And that's the reason I've tried to be careful of defining what I mean by undirected neo-Darwinian sort of evolution as the type of evolution that I'm that uh, we're critiquing. But information is a is a term which is thrown around a lot, but nobody sits down to define it. And if you think about it, you have to answer things of the following type, questions of the following type. If I take a DVD and I shred it, am I destroying information? If I take a book and I burn it, am I destroying information? When I take a picture with my camera and all of that information is stored, we know that there's a certain amount of bits. Am I creating information? And again, if I destroy it, uh, if, if I erase that file, have I destroyed information? So the answer to that question is it depends on your definition of information. And as a nerd, I like to see it precisely defined so that we can talk about it uh, without ambiguity. In the world of information, there are two major theories. One is Shannon information. He founded information theory in one great paper in 1948. And we're still using his technology today. Your cell phones use uh, technology that was derived from Shannon's 1948 paper. He was a uh, guy that worked for Bell Labs, just an incredible genius. And the other one is so-called Kolmogorov information theory, which is a different type of information. It's sometimes referred to Kolmogorov, Chaitin, Solomonov uh, information theory because there were there were three guys that that discovered it independently of each other. In fact, the middle name Chaitin is the one that said, hey, in evolution, we must come up with a model uh, and prove Darwin. Darwin's right or wrong. So he was, that's the reason I say he was, uh, he, he was a true genius and maybe one of the most creative mathematicians, at least of my generation. So that has to do with actual structure. And it's the Kolmogorov information that is a part of our world and as much a part of creation as is matter and energy and time and all the other th stuff that we talk about. So again, we need to define exactly what we mean by that information. Um, mm. Can I just ask you here, um, sure. just coming at it from a very intuitive approach, um, you know, you're asking about, do you destroy the information that's on a book when you burn it? I was just thinking if you were to read that book into a dictation machine, and then you were to destroy the book, would you then have destroyed the information? The information would have been transferred. Exactly. Exactly. It's not a material thing, is it? No. And this is the fascinating part. Uh, Norbert Wiener, Great name for a guy. Norbert Wiener uh, was the father of cybernetics. And he said information is information, neither matter nor energy. In other words, you can take information and you can write it on energy. That's what we use in our wireless communications, right? Mm -hmm. We have all this information flowing around in the airwaves on uh, electromagnetic fields. It could also be etched onto matter. That's what a CD or a DVD or a book is. Information has been etched on matter. But the matter itself and the energy itself is not information. Information lies separate from that. Mm. It could even be knotted onto string, couldn't it? Isn't it the ancient uh, South Americans used to have a way of writing just by putting knots in string? <laughs> I'm not familiar with that, but certainly that would be very close to the ones and zeros that we use, wouldn't it? Indeed, indeed. So you've got this uh, Shannon information, and I'm going to abbreviate this, the KCS information. Those are two different measures of information, is that right? Yes, yes. And the first one, the Shannon one, has to do with probability, measuring it in terms of probability. And the other one, the KCS, has something to do with making the smallest computer program that could describe the information. Is that the basic difference between the two? Yes. Uh, KCS information. Uh, you're familiar with 3D printers, of course. But mm. suppose somebody was to write a program and they wanted to do the bust of... Uh, 
I better use somebody British. Uh, they were going to use the bust of Churchill, for example. So they were going to do a three-dimensional bust of Churchill. And so they wrote the program. They wanted to get everything. One of the most famous uh, pictures of Churchill, I understand, he had the scowl on his face, which the photographer got by taking away a cigar. And so we're, we're going to do that bust uh, with all of the detail, including the scowl and all of the hairs and everything. And then we're going to do a 3D printer of a bowling ball. Now, the question is, which of those programs is going to be longer? It's going to be the one that generated Churchill's bust, right? Mm -hmm. So Churchill's bust has more complexity than a bowling ball. There's more complexity there. And that is the fundamental idea of the Kolmogorov or KCS information theory measure. Mm -hmm. So it actually measures the information content of things which exist. Okay, but now this is different, isn't it, from meaningful information exactly uh, which comes under the term which william Demsky used anyway called specified complexity specified complexity yes exactly yeah could you tell us the difference then between just information per se and meaningful information well the idea is you could probably get a rock from out in the quarry which had as much detail as um as churchill's bust and the program to generate that rock with all of its bumps and crevices and things like that might be a program which was long as generating uh, Churchill's bust. Mm. So both of them would have the same, if you will, complexity. The difference is, is that Churchill's bust is specified complexity. In other words, in the context of, of the observer, and this turns out to be very important in the work, in the context of the observer, there is meaning in Lincoln's bust, and there isn't that much meaning in association with, with the rock that you have. And the question is, is how do you measure that? Mm. And the way you measure that is you bring in the context, and it's like you have these little uh, sub-programs. You know, you have one that says, uh, looks like Churchill, for example, and you use that to write the program that generates the bust, but you don't use that little program in counting the length of the overall program. And so the more context that you bring in um, about what you're trying to generate, the better the result is going to be and the more meaning you are going to have to the final result. So not only does it have to be complex, it needs to be specified. Um, I had a little example here that might help. I don't know. Um, I was thinking of, say, our kitchen floor here. And if I had 100 marbles in a bag and I just dropped those, they would eventually stop and they would have certain positions and you could map those positions. There's a certain amount of information involved in describing where all those marbles are positioned on the floor. However, that seems to be a completely random situation. But if I did it again and I had a map that I'd drawn out where I wanted all the marbles to actually end up, and I drop the marbles again, and they just happen to end up where I had these dots on my map. I would be absolutely astonished by that. That would be meaningful. I would think something's going on here. And yet, I presume, in terms of Shannon information, it would be exactly the same amount of information involved. One would be not meaningful, and one would be meaningful. Yes, that's true. And if you dropped your marbles and they spelled out something like, uh, uh, hello, you would say, wow, that has a lot of meaning yeah. because those marbles uh, fell down and they spelled out the, the name hello. And why is that meaningful? Because you have the context of hello in your observation. And if some alien came down and looked at those same marbles, they would go, oh, that's that's meaningless. Mm. All right. And so to move on then to these evolutionary programs, they are claiming to produce meaningful information in the sense of biologically viable organisms that's what we mean by meaning in that context and you're saying there exists no mathematical model of neo-darwinian evolution that stands up to scrutiny no model that describes this real generation of specified complexity meaning meaningful information um, there are models ev avida that you discuss in the, in the book none of them is successful um so you say that because of your analysis these models are showing something of embedded knowledge or active information, some sort of input that's necessary for any of these models even to have a chance of working. Could you talk us through how you go about showing that that is the case? Yes, exactly. There is the concept of a blind search, which means that you're trying to get a result and you have no idea of the structure that you're attempting to exploit. Uh, there's a couple places I could go for explanation. Let me go with um, 
the iterative design. Mm. We want to come up with a with a design, and all design is basically iterative. Do you guys have uh, WD forty? We do indeed. WD forty, yes. Okay, WD forty is named because it took forty trials in order to get the result. Right. Yeah. Formula four hundred nine took four hundred nine results. Now, finding that result is a dependent upon the domain expertise of the designer or somebody from high school that just took a chemistry class tried to invent WD-40. We would probably be calling it WD-9000 or something. Okay. So when you say domain expertise, this is somebody who is trained in that particular area of study. That's what you mean? Yes, exactly. Okay. Somebody that knows what they're doing. That is contrasted to blind search. There's a couple of really great examples. One is in Weird Al Yankovic's movie, UHF. Are you familiar with Weird Al Yankovic? I've never heard of it at all, no. (laughs) Okay. He's a strange guy that does weird things. But anyway, that's not important. But the scene is of two guys sitting on a park bench. One of them is blind, and you know he's blind because he has a cane and is wearing the glasses. Next to him is a sighted person, and the blind guy has a Rubik's Cube. And what he does is he twists the cube, puts it in front of the sighted guy and say, is this it? And the guy looks and says, no. So he takes it back and he twists the Rubik cube and he puts it in front of the guy and he says, is this it? And the guy goes, no. Now that's a literal example of a blind search. There, there is no uh, domain expertise mm-hmm. being employed to solve that Rubik's cube problem. Another one is uh, in the uh, great movie, uh, Dumber and Dumber, by the way, if you go back to the Rubik's Cube, there is a chance that the guy might solve it, right? Indeed. Yeah, there, there is a chance. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that leads us to something called Burrell's Law, but I'll talk about that next. But in Dumb and Dumber, uh, have you seen the movie Dumb and Dumber? I haven't seen that either. No, I have heard of it, though. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, there's, 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 there's a great scene where uh, Lloyd Christmas, played by um, – Man, the name escapes me at the minute. But he's kind of a really dumb guy. And he goes up to this really uh, good-looking lady. And he said, what's the chance of you and me getting together? Is it about one in a hundred? And she said, no, it's about one in a million. And uh, he says, so you're telling me there's a chance. That was his response. (laughs) It's not Jim Carrey, is it, by any chance? Yeah, it was. It was Jim Carrey. That's right. It was Jim Carrey. He said, but you're telling me you're a chance. Now, the reason that is funny and the reason the Rubik's Cube example is funny is because we know the chance of that happening is so small that it will never happen. And the more complex your design is going to be, the more complexity that you want out of your final search program, the more difficult that problem is going to be. And so domain expertise embedded in the program is absolutely necessary in order to get you towards that end result. Okay, so coming back to your WD-40 example here, uh, presumably if you had enough trials, you might eventually end up with a WD-999,999. Not that anybody would invest in that because it would be a complete waste of money to try and produce something like that. But I'm thinking that, I mean, I'm just throwing this in sideways to see how how I react to this. Um, Some people might say, well, you know, in a universe that's as big as ours and perhaps even a multiverse, then maybe that chance just comes up somewhere. And uh, in terms of evolutionary biology, you may, in fact, get evolution happening, even though it's extremely unlikely and on an anthropic understanding well we're just here we see ourselves in this world and we think we're special but actually we're just thrown up by chance in a multiverse yes in fact i think william Dembski refers to that as probability of the gaps um <laughs> yes. and, and, and it's it's an apt description mm. let me tell you what we did we wanted to come up with uh, a probability that everybody would say no that's impossible and if the probability of something happen is so small that that it can't be comprehended, then we can announce it as being impossible. Uh, That's something referred to, by the way, way, as Burrell's law. It actually isn't a law. It's more of a a rule of thumb, if you will. But uh, as I type, there is a chance that my thumb will quantum tunnel through the space bar when I hit it. Uh, There is a finite probability, okay? But I can do that forever. So how do you come up with a probability that is inarguably so small that it can't be it can't be questioned okay here's what we did we took a plank length now a plank length is a small length that they use in string theory and to give you an idea of how small it is if you scaled a plank length up into a uh, an inch then the diameter of a proton would be several light years i mean that is small 
So we divided up the universe into Planck cubes, which was a little cube that had a Planck length on each side. And there's so many Planck cubes in the known universe. Then we took the uh, Big Bang cosmology estimation of the age of the Earth or the age of the universe. And we divided that up into Planck times. Now, Planck time is the time it takes light to travel a Planck length. Well, Planck lengths are really small, so it doesn't take very long for light to travel that, that length. Then we multiplied the number of Planck cubes in the universe times the number of Planck times since the beginning of the universe. And we got a number. And we said, look, if there is one chance in all of this happening, then no, it's impossible. Okay. It doesn't happen. Then we even said, well, maybe we're not thinking as small a probability as we need to. So we took the theory out of string theory, which says there's 10 to the hundredth to 10 to the thousandth parallel universes. And then we said, okay, suppose there's 10 to the thousandth universes. And we're going to assume that each universe is like ours. So we take whatever the Planck cube, Planck time thing is, and we'll multiply it by 10 to the thousand. So now we have all sorts of probability. Now, I don't think anybody can argue that one chance in that big number is ever going to happen. Yet we were able to show that if in a simple problem of choosing random letters in order to generate meaningful phrases, that one could not even and this is going to sound amazing, and you have to look at the book for the mathematics because the results are mind-blowing, but the mathematics are, are totally solid. You cannot even generate a document as long as the Gettysburg Address with that information content. Yeah. So, yes, there can be a probability, but, you know, it's like my thumb quantum tunneling through my space bar or one chance and all of these big numbers with the multiverse. Mm, as you say, I love that phrase. There's a chance of the gaps, did you say? Oh, I think uh, Bill Dembski referred as the probability of the gaps. The probability of the gaps, yes. Indeed. And it's just it's just like Lloyd Christmas saying in Dumb and Dumber, so you're telling me there's a chance. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So um, blind search then is just a complete waste of time to consider that to be an explanation of what's going on in the natural world. Um, so this is why, of course, we do have these evolutionary algorithms which purport to show that, in fact, the system itself can generate the information that's necessary for it not to be just a blind search, but to be a quasi-intelligent search that's going on in nature. Um, but you say that these evolutionary algorithms are not really doing that. They are smuggling in information from the programmers in, in every case. Um, so how do you actually show that that's the case? Well, we actually talk about the Burrell's uh, theorem, but I go back to a 1997 paper. This was uh, in the in the open literature that introduced something called the no free lunch theorem. And the paper really popularized the idea, although the concept had been presented before, but it popularized the idea that if one did not have domain expertise, if one didn't have an idea where they were going, that one search would be as good as any other search. It was really an astonishing result that took the machine intelligence community by surprise because before then people would say, my algorithm is better than your algorithm, and they would try to publish and, and prove that. But the No Free Lunch says that no, on average, every, every computer search algorithm is as good as any other one. Now, that being the case, that means that on average, blind search – is going to be uh, as good as any other search that we had, an evolutionary search. So that's the reason that we can compare any search process to the blind search, look at the difference between the blind search and the results that were achieved, and we can literally measure the distance between the two, and we can do it in bits. And that's something called active information, which Bill Dembski and I introduced in a uh, engineering paper back in 2003 or something like that. Okay, so when you take these things like Avida, EV, and the others that are out there, they seem to fare better than a blind search. How do you go about showing that the reason why they do is because they've had active information put into them in some way, whether that's done deliberately or uh, unintentionally, that's your claim? Well, I, I don't believe that any of these people that write these programs do this on purpose for the reason of deceiving. Hmm. I think that they're simply numbed by the familiarity that they have with uh, with evolution. They say, well, yeah, it needs to be there. Uh, I will tell you in EV, for example, there is one element in there that tells you you're getting closer, you're getting closer, you're getting closer to the, uh, to the answer that I have designed in my program for you to achieve. If I was to hide, and here, here's an example, if I was to hide an Easter egg in the state of Wyoming, 
And I said, go find it by blind search. You would have a big problem finding it because Wyoming is really big and the Easter egg is really small. But if you have a kind person with domain expertise that telling you you're getting warmer, you're getting warmer. Oh, no, you're getting colder. You're getting warmer again. Mm -hmm. That person with this domain expertise would guide you towards the egg. And you would find it in a finite amount of time. But without that expertise, you couldn't do that. And in EV, for example, it has a literal thing called a hamming oracle that actually tells you on each iteration how close you are to the solution yeah. and therefore guides you towards that solution. And it's just like the guy in Wyoming telling you where the Easter egg is at. So not only can we measure it, we, we do have the ability to identify the source of active information and the expertise that is placed within the algorithm. So when you point that out, what's the response of EV theorists? Do they come back to you and say, well, this particular component of the program, which is putting the active information in, um, corresponds to this aspect of neo-Darwinian theory? Do they come back with you? Well, they do, because some people say, well, that's just the way nature is. OK, well, if that's the way nature is, then nature is supplying information to guide the evolutionary process. So fine, I I would agree to them. Uh, we have found in general that, that the writers of these programs are strangely silent to our criticism. And usually that isn't the case when you write something uh, that, that, that even mm. that even smells of intelligent design. You get all of these uh, new atheists coming out and really trolling you. But that, you know, that doesn't happen. The bigger problem is that the results have not been popularized, and therefore people are doing this again and again and again. And we have written papers, a number of papers, where we actually go to a popularized evolutionary program. We say, ah, not only does it have this active information, but here's the source of it. And then another one comes out, and we say, you know, here's, here's the active information, here's the source of it. So the problem is it's repeated, and I think that as people find out that is going to impress them. Until then, I think we'll see a bunch of other wasted papers. So. Well, what confuses me about this is when they do come back to you, or they might come back to you, what part of neo-Darwinian evolution could they point to as a source of this active information? Uh, that, that's a good question. I, I don't think that they have a solution. They can say, that's the way it is. You mentioned the anthropic principle. I think that they say, yeah, this is the biological equivalent of the cosmological anthropic principle. And, you know, gosh, if this wasn't the way it is, we wouldn't be here to notice and write papers about it. So I think that's a common response also. Uh, kind of circular reasoning to smack of that. Anyway, um, I mean, one of these things that you mentioned was the NASA antenna. This has been produced by evolutionary processes, but you say there, there's also an example of active information. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Well, engineers design things. That's the reason I think that most engineers are more friendly towards intelligent design than other people because we know what goes into design. But for the um, for the evolutionary development of the antenna, they needed domain expertise. And what they did is they brought in this software. And what the software does is it analyzes the response and the characteristics of the antenna that they're trying to synthesize. And so it's just like, you're getting warmer, you're getting warmer, you're getting uh, colder, you're getting colder. Every time a new uh, design potential is presented by the computer to this software, it says, ah, this is getting better. You're getting warmer. You're getting closer to the solution. Mm -hmm. And so uh, basically the computer allows us to explore numerous solutions to a design problem and the computer lets us walk through those very, very quickly. One of the ways to walk through them very, very quickly is using evolutionary programming. And that's um, that's what they did. But the domain expertise was, number one, the use of that software. Number two was the knowledge how to guide the design of the antenna using this software. And you also discuss a little bit Richard Dawkins in your book um, and his step-by-step -step approach that he talks about in his various books. And I was very interested that you did that because having read a, a couple of books by him in previous years, I was struck by the kind of suspicious thing that he's doing there sometimes. I mean, I re remember The Blind Watchmaker and um, he had these computer creatures that he'd created on his computer that he, he said could evolve step-by-step -step into new creatures by random changes plus selection, etc. And they were gradually following an evolutionary pathway to a creature at the end of the process. And I did think, well, that works on your computer, but how does that actually map onto reality? I mean, why should I think that any of those creatures would be viable creatures in the real world? 
you know, aren't you just assuming the truth that there are these viable pathways that you're describing because you already believe in gradualism? You already believe in step by step processes. You seem to be offering a criticism a little, a little bit like that in your book. Well, yes, I think the most popular uh, Dawkins thing is the phrase, me thinks it is like a weasel, which he took from Hamlet. And uh, what Dawkins did, if that's what you're referring to, is he applied a little evolutionary program where he applied the three steps of classic evolution. It was mutation, repopulation, survival of the fittest, repeat. And uh, you kept on doing that. But you will notice that in that process that every time in determining the uh, survival of the fittest, he was able to ascertain how close he was to his target. In other words, he had a goal in mind. This is another thing neo-Darwinian people say is that you don't have a goal in mind. Well, it turns out all of the algorithms published by the neo-Darwinists have a goal in mind. Uh, but Dawkins had a goal in mind too. And what he was doing at every step by determining the fitness, he says, ooh, this one's really close. Ooh, this one is far away. This one is close, too. And so he was doing exactly the same thing as the Easter egg hunt in Wyoming. Mm. It doesn't really prove anything, does it? Because it doesn't mean that there's necessarily going to be an organism in the real world that will correspond, a viable organism that will correspond to that stage in the process. Uh, yes. Well, that's that's another thing which I think a lot of the a lot of the people who write these programs ignore is that in every step you have to have functional viability. Mm. For example, every step in Dawkins simulation is not a meaningful phrase in the English language. It would die in the evolutionary sort of development. Yeah. So there has to be functional viability at every single point in the evolutionary uh, evolutionary process. And we talk about that in the book a little bit also. Mm. Yeah, fascinating stuff. Um, now, I want to ask you about this notion of the conservation of information, which you suggest places a limit upon what these evolutionary programs can do and are likely ever to do. Could you give us an idea of what that means, the conservation of information? Well, there's actually a number of uh, aspects of conservation of information. One goes back to the no free lunch theorem saying that all search algorithms on average are going to perform the same. And so therefore, we can always go back and compare things to a blind search. So that, that's one aspect. The other one is uh, something which I call Basiner's theorem. Uh, it turns out that all of the evolutionary programs that you have reach something which I call basin or ceiling above and beyond which that evolutionary program cannot go. You cannot exceed the expertise of the resident uh, oracle or source of knowledge. So if I define for, or if I generate, for example, a, a computer program that is going to learn how to play chess, which has been done. That program is not going to go on and learn Go. It's not going to go on and give you financial advice. It's not going to do anything above and beyond what it's designed to do. It is a process that hits a ceiling. And nobody has ever come up with a viable reason or a viable algorithm to actually exceed that, uh, that ceiling. There's some that say, well, you can evolve to a certain point, then you change the fitness and you go to another point and then you change the fitness and you go to a third point. But actually the scheduling of those changes in fitnesses makes the problem much more difficult and much more um, unlikely to occur by chance. So those, those are the two basic ideas. Well, that brings us on to this rather difficult notion of the search for the search. But I do want to ask you just briefly to give us an idea about this. If you're saying that the algorithm might have to be tweaked here and tweaked there in order to accommodate the next stage of evolution or, or whatever, then it seems that in a way we're looking for more and more information to be input in order to make this series of computer uh, or instantiations of the uh, computer program to work. But you say in the book that searching for these searches is, is expensive in terms of information, in fact, can be even far more expensive in terms of information. So if you're searching for the perfect search, that's a terrible situation to be in. Do you want to say something about that? Yeah, it, it, it is a terrible situation. Um, most computer scientists that do search sort of algorithms have their own favorite catalog of searches. If you look at the number of search algorithms, they're enormous. You have, let's see if I can rattle some off. You have particle swarm, you have steepest descent, you have evolutionary search, uh, you have something called taboo search. And there's a list of them in the book. I think we list like 80 uh, different possible searches. And the question is, you come up with a problem, which one of those searches are you going to use? Um, the best you can do is 
again, go to your domain expertise and say, you know, for this sort of problem, this this sort of uh, search algorithm uh, works very, very well. But suppose, on the other hand, that we were able to give the computer the job of searching for the search. And so what we want to do, at least in one sense, is to look through all of those different uh, search algorithms and choose the best one for the problem that we have. It turns out that that searching for the search is exponentially more difficult than the original search. So you can't kick the can down the street. There's a regress, which shows that as you search for the search, and I guess you could search for the search for the search. We never thought about that. But we know <laughs> that if you search for the search, at least that gets exponentially more difficult. Hmm. So it doesn't matter where you go with analyzing the situation. You keep coming back to intelligent input. And if you don't have intelligent input, you're just presented with a bigger and bigger problem to do it in a blind way. Yes, exactly. It, yes. I, imagine doing a blind search for an algorithm which has a certain amount of active information that makes the guy sitting next the blind guy sitting next to the uh, the sighted guy with a rubik's cube look like a genius because that is going to take forever squared and some kind of perhaps a neo darwinian search for a perfect neo darwinian theory that's uh, un- unimaginable <laughs> it is it is unimaginable absolutely i had uh, i was writing a computer program one of my colleagues here randall jean came in and uh, Randall said, what are you doing? I says, I'm writing a uh, evolutionary program. And he says, oh, great. When can I talk to him? <laughs> and his, his response yeah. really uh, humorously illustrates the basin or ceiling idea. That, that evolutionary program was going to do exactly what I wanted it to do, and it would do no more. And that is also true of all of the programs that have been generated by the neo-Darwinists to purport uh, illustration of neo-Darwinism. Okay, well, let me throw out you a couple of challenges here. So some might say you've got a false dilemma. Neo-Darwinian processes are not working here. So you're saying, oh, well, it's uh, intelligent design. Is there not a third way? Some are pointing in the direction of a kind of neo-Lamarckianism. They're saying, uh, well, what about the possibility of epigenetic processes that might be helping to drive evolution? So there are, there may be these um, stable traits um, that are inheritable that uh, you know can't be explained by by DNA changes, they're, they're sort of extra to DNA sequence changes, they're epigenetic processes. Maybe these can be um, used to help explain evolution. Is there anything to that, do you think? Well, the question is, is where does that information come from eventually? Is, is that something which has been generated by chance or, or whatever? Uh, I have been following uh, the work of James Shapiro at the University of Chicago, who is not a proponent of intelligent design, but his work on epigenetics uh, in my mind is just jaw-dropping. Again, I'm not a biologist, but I know enough, as I say, to be dangerous. Uh, But his exposition says that, yes, in the cell, there is a teleological purpose for the cell. In fact, cells will do things which aren't used for a few generations down the road, and that there is this idea of uh, targeting in the process. So all of these things in epigenetics are just mind numbing. And again, if you have this epigenetic thing working, you have to ask, where does that information come from? What, what is happening here? Why does it happen? It's the, uh, it's kind of the verb, if you will, in the noun of DNA. So right. you have all of these processes which are happening and man, getting the process to happen. That's a, that's a rough design problem in itself. So that wouldn't get rid of the information problem. It would just demand an explanation and it would be subject to the same kind of analysis. Yes, exactly. That's that's my understanding. And in fact, I think Shapiro uses the word uh, something engineering. I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but it is uh, engineering, which happens in the cell. And they've had to develop an algorithm, a, a procedure to do these things. Mm. Something to watch, certainly. Um, Okay, what about the other one then, which I'm calling the sort of Kaufman approach? Um, So this would be more the idea that there are self-organizing principles taking place within biology in addition to Darwinian natural selection. So maybe these self-organizing ideas can help to provide the active information that's necessary. Well, I am somewhat familiar with Kaufman's work. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Stephen Wolfram and his book, A New Type of Science, where he explores some of the same sort of things. But Kaufman has been a big um, a big proponent of artificial life, where he looks at finite automata and these interacting rules. 
I've talked about this with my colleague, uh, Keith Schubert here. I mentioned he does work in extreme environments where there's life forms that exist in sulfur caves. And he's using these approaches to attempt to model the life that exists there. And his comment is that these sort of things happening are basically probability of the gap sort of arguments again. That yes, you can get these sort of things, but show me. I maintain there exists no hard science model of neo-Darwinian evolution. If that's wrong and Kaufman is right, I would like to see it. I think Kaufman actually admits to the fact that there needs to be a guiding force behind even his work. Right. I don't remember where I read that, but Kaufman actually has a chapter in a book that I edited with Michael Behe and William Dembski, and uh, he's very critical of intelligent design, of course, but I think he's honest in his critique of the limitations of the procedure he's using. So if Kaufman's right, that wouldn't be neo-Darwinianism properly anyway, would it? Well, you have to ask what guides the sifting property. Mm. It, it does turn out that in any search, in any process where you develop the specification, there's always randomness. You have randomness in, in evolution, for example. Evolution has uh, mutation. That is a, that's a stochastic sort of phenomenon. And uh, there are ways of, of, of applying probability in these search algorithms to shake yourself out of local minima to get better and better and better and better. But still, you have to have an idea and you have to have a guidance in the sifting property to arrive at your final result. Mm. There has to be a guiding force. And that is something that uh, is, it seems to be common to everything in evolution, as I understand it from biology, certainly from an engineering computer science point of view, there needs to be something guiding the process. So if Kaufman is right, there still needs to be a guidance there. Yeah, and that would still need explanation. Absolutely. Um, okay, well, before we move to the, the last section, which is to do with the artificial intelligence, which is related to what we've been talking about, I did want to ask you a couple of questions to do with the other book, which I read just before yours, um, another excellent book, Being as Communion, a Metaphysics of Information by your colleague, William A. Dembski. And uh, there are a couple of very interesting, well, many interesting thoughts, but these are the ones I want to ask you about. The idea that information may be fundamental, that is, as far as I understand it correctly, that in the final analysis, when we're investigating the stuff of nature, well, we never really arrive at a fundamental knowledge of what matter is. Instead of that, we're presented with layers and layers of patterns and relationships, which may be described in informational terms. So therefore, maybe reality is fundamentally information. What do you think of that idea? Well, Stephen Penrose recently had a comment that reality is, he thinks, is in some way strangely related to consciousness, hmm. and that this uh, reality doesn't come out until there is an observer, because it always takes an observer to collapse these wave functions and things of that sort. So that's something I'm very interested in and going to read up on that actually consciousness is a part of reality. I do agree with Bill that indeed information is, is foundational to our universe. I gave you the example of the Comagora for KCS sort of information about the three-dimensional printer that printed out the bust of Churchill in a bowling ball. Yeah. That in itself is a way which I think can be universally applied to measure the complexity of everything in the universe. Uh, you measure it by the program that generates it. And if there's a program that generates it, there's the shortest program that generates it. And the shortest program is something known as the Kolmogorov information content. Chaitin calls them elegant programs. But there exists a shortest program to generate the bowling ball. There exists a shortest program to generate the bust of Churchill. That describes the complexity of the object. Then you have to fold in some of the ideas of meaning into the object and that meaning must come from context and that's something that Winston Ewart has pioneered. He has actually come up with a way to measure meaning of objects and that meaning can actually be measured in bits and the results are really incredible. For example, uh, and this is in the book also, an example of a deck of cards and if you play poker, all of a sudden a, a royal flush has a lot of meaning. And we can actually measure the meaning associated with the royal flush in the context of poker and measure it in bits. And it also answers the question of complex things exist all the time. Uh, we apply Winston's theory uh, to one snowflake and there's 
nothing remarkable about it. Snowflakes are very complex, but they don't have a lot of meaning. And if one actually looks at two different snowflakes, well, that doesn't have a lot of meaning too. But if you actually apply this theory to two identical snowflakes, all of a sudden the meaning, the algorithmic specified complexity goes up. So this is a theory that is developing. I actually have a student here that's looking into some other aspects of algorithmic information theory and its applicability possibly to data mining. And it's just it's just a fascinating area. Yes, indeed. And I was uh, fascinated by what you were saying about somebody theorizing about the collapsing of the wave function with respect to reality itself, um, the consciousness being involved in this. And I was thinking what um, William Dembski at least seems to be moving towards in that book is the notion that the universe might actually be mind-like. And I don't think he means in a pantheistic sense, um, but more like the product of mind. Thought, perhaps. Uh, maybe thought. A really interesting thing to explore. Do you have anything to say about that kind of thinking? Well, it's uh, simply, as I understand it, that the outcome of a observation doesn't happen until the observation happens. That's the collapse of the wave function. Mm. And there's a fantastic uh, theorem called Bell's theorem. And I used to always wonder about this with predestination versus free will. My father explained it to me. He says, if you have a hole and you go dig a ditch, is the ditch there and you just took the dirt out or are you creating the ditch that was the, that was his simple explanation <laughs> and, and, and it, it really captures the idea of the two and uh, frankly it doesn't matter but there's actually been work done uh, for when a wave equation collapses is it actually that the reality existed there before you looked at it and you're just removing a cover from that reality or did you actually create uh something random and it seems like that ditch sort of analogy, mm -hmm. but it turns out it isn't. Uh, Bell's theorem came along and gave an experiment, which actually has been done without any loopholes in the past few years to show that, no, what is created is random. It didn't exist there before. So it's actually a creation of a few bits of information, if you will. So this happens all the time. And every time we observe something and these wave, wave functions collapse, we have new information in the universe. It's just astonishing. And perhaps this is pointing in the direction of the mind with a capital M, or God, we would say, from a Christian perspective, actually collapsing, as it were, the, the, the massive wave function, which is the reality in which we live. It's certainly an interesting thing to think about, isn't it? Well, I, I think one of the interesting things, which my colleague Keith Schubert, a really great Christian, pointed out, who was the first observer? Yeah. Who was the first observer that actually started reality yeah. Uh, yeah. from the physics that we know? So mm -hmm. it's a, it, I don't know how relevant it is, but it sure is fun to think about. Absolutely. Yeah. And of course, your example there with the dig in the hole reminded me of Winnie the Pooh and Piglet moving a hole from one place to another, having dug it. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. uh, lastly, um, just briefly about this artificial intelligence mm -hmm. question. There's another issue that you discuss in the book. You say that artificial intelligence will never, in your view, match the creativity of the human mind. It will never be truly conscious. Now, this is very interesting because we're frequently being warned to be fearful of artificial intelligence, not so much how it might be used by human beings, but precisely because of the possibility of its own self-awareness and, and creative intelligence. You challenge that in the book. Tell us why you basically do challenge that. Well, again, this is going back to fundamentals. It turns out that the Turing machine can only do algorithms. It can only perform recipes. A recipe is an algorithm. Like when you bake a cake, it tells you what to do, when, how many eggs to add, how to whip it up, how long to put it in the oven. So it's a sequence of steps. And that's exactly what an algorithm is. Now, the original Turing machine could only do algorithms. It turns out every computer that we have today, what we can do on it can also be done on Turing's original machine. Now, it might take 500 times as long, but it still can be done on Turing's machine. So the takeaway is that computers can only do things algorithmic. We have a number of examples of things which are non-algorithmic. Uh, for the nerd's perspective, the so-called Turing halting problem, which, which I won't go into, but there are, there are some solid examples. Um, some more interesting examples purported by uh, Roger Penrose is the creativity that we see in human beings. Remember I said that an evolutionary computer programming uh, that was supposed to learn chess would no, never go on to give you financial advice. Uh, you know, it does what it does, what it was programmed mm -hmm. to do. And so it stops there. And, 
there are numerous examples, both in science and in the arts, of the so-called flash of genius. Uh, there's a bunch of examples. Friedrich Gauss, who was a big mathematician, said that he got an idea like a sudden flash of lightning and the riddle was solved. Uh, Nikola Tell says he said the idea for the alternating current machine just came to him out of nowhere. And he was able to actually sit down and famously write his uh, uh, diagram in the dirt of the of the machine. And even in the arts, uh, this is going to sound funny going from Nikola Tesla to uh, the Beatles. But uh, Paul McCartney said he woke up one morning and had this tune running through his head. And he thought, I couldn't have written this. Where did this come from? And he, he went around to all these people and said, I had this tune. And it was the tune for yesterday. And it had just come to him in a creative flash. In the United States, it used to be the law that you had to have a flash of genius before you had a patent. They have removed that terminology. But it is this creativity. And the implications of this are more than just the mind not being a computer. Uh, But I I think that if one were to take these non-materialistic ideas that they would have application all over the place. And that's that's something that we're exploring right now with one of my students. Sure. I'll just have one comeback on that. And that would be that, okay, so Paul McCartney says, you know, he woke up and he had this idea and you're saying that's a flash of inspiration. But couldn't you argue that, in fact, his brain was working with various algorithms while he was asleep and he just wasn't conscious of it and up came the idea, but it was robotically created while he was asleep? (laughs) Well, I I will tell you that so far there has been no computer program that has ever generated anything creative. There was this... uh, They have it. They do exactly what you tell them to do. Now, some of this deep learning stuff has come up with some interesting stuff about composing music or composing plays. Uh The plays are terrible. In fact, if you have you seen them? No, but I had an example only a couple of weeks ago on the radio where there was supposedly this piece of music that was composed by artificial intelligence. And, you know, there was a great big headlines about it. How wonderful it was. And I listened to it. And I was listening. I thought, well, it's well crafted. But actually, it's exactly the kind of thing I would expect an early 21st century classical music composer to have written. And I thought to myself, they've programmed it to do that. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that, that's the, also the case with these plays that they've come up with. Uh, there's one on YouTube where there's the acting out of this play that was supposedly written by a computer. But you go to the um, transcript, the actual script for the play. And it's embarrassing. It says the guy's head was in the clouds. He was in the window. He takes the shotgun off the wall and puts it in his mouth. All of these totally disjoint things. But you watch it in the actual play and the actors make it look so smooth that, you know, it looks like it might be something. But no, I I would challenge anybody that said that um, they have computers that generated something creative. If they do and they can prove it, that's fine. I Mm -hmm. believe the creativity, getting back to the fundamentals, is non-algorithmic. You cannot write a step-by-step procedure to, to do creativity, and computers are limited to algorithms. Right, so you're saying it's in principle impossible, not that the computing capability is just not that advanced yet. No, because again, all computers today, there's something called the Church-Turing thesis, which says that everything we can do on all of the computers we have today can be done on this original Turing machine done in the 1930s on the back of an envelope by Alan Turing. And so they're all equivalent. And so if Turing's machine couldn't do it, none of the computers we have today are going to do it. And making it faster or making more memory or things of that sort, we're going to get more and more interesting results, clearly, but we're still not going to get creativity. Hmm. Fascinating indeed. Um, But this doesn't necessarily mean that we should have no concerns about artificial intelligence, because, of course, at the end of the day, it's still the case. We can ask, well, who's in charge of the (laughs) artificial intelligence? You have the human thing to worry about there, don't you? Well, you do. And I think that this is probably true of any new technology. For example, Tesla and Edison went around and Edison was trying to tell everybody that Tesla's alternating current was terrible. So he ran around scaring people by electrocuting animals at state fairs, even electrocuted an elephant with AC and even went to the government and said, let's not call it the electric chair. Uh, They called it guillotine in France, named after Dr. Guillotine, who 
invented it. He said, well, let's call it Westinghouse. So you wouldn't be electrocuted, you'd be Westinghouse. So there was fear about AC electricity. And yeah, you know, there's problems uh, with AC electricity, but I tell you, the advantages are really nice. With computers, we're going to have the same sort of, sort of thing. We're going to have loss of privacy. We got hacking. We got malicious attacks, especially the few that we've heard about recently. But then there's the positives. Uh, you know, we have my goodness, we have all the world's knowledge at our fingertips. This just blows my mind. Uh, so anyway, it's like any new technology. There's going to be the good parts. There's going to be the bad parts. But the idea that a computer will be conscious, that will understand people or understand things, uh, it just isn't going to happen. Really, really interesting, mind-blowing stuff, mind-bending stuff. But uh, it has been a wonderful interview. Thank you ever so much for joining me. Not not easy, not easy subject, but I do think it's well worth engaging with. And I do recommend the book. This is Introduction to Evolutionary Informatics by Marx, Dembski and Ewart, which is published by World Scientific. Available also, of course, from other booksellers, including Amazon. Please don't be put off by it, even if you're not all that keen on mathematical symbols and the like, because there's still ample discussion, as I said before, plenty of illustration to get get the flow of the argument. And it's even very entertaining in many ways with with um, sections describing how to get the perfect pancake, which I was going to ask you about, but uh, didn't happen in the conversation. So uh, let me also recommend what I'm calling the companion book to this, William Dembski's Being as Communion, more philosophical, but very much drawing on this kind of research that we've discussed today. Um, also fascinating theologically and philosophically, and I will have links to that book as well in the show notes. So two books there for your library, both recommended just before we close, Dr. Marx. Um, if people would like to find out further information about this work beyond the book, um, is it the Center for Evolutionary Informatics that people go to? Yes, the Center of Evolutionary Informatics is uh, a nonprofit which is used to support people doing research in the sort of things that we're talking about now. But the place to go for information is evoinfo.org. E V O I N F O dot org. My wife doesn't like it because she says it sounds like evil, evil info, but it isn't evil. It's evo, E V O I N F O dot org. Now, there, uh, if you want to make a donation, there's a place to donate. But I think more importantly, if you want to dig deep, if you're a true nerd and you want to go into the papers, all of the papers are posted there and you can download them and look at them um, in a PDF sort of format. And what we tried to do in the book is try to gather all of these papers and present them in a fashion where the pseudo non-nerd could understand them. So hopefully we've, hopefully we've done that in Introduction to Evolutionary Informatics. Wonderful. And you have uh, frequently asked questions there on that website. But if people do want to ask you any further questions, is that possible in any way? Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, probably the easiest way to get to me is r.marks at IEEE, I-E-E-E dot org. r.marks at IEEE dot org. And would you be happy for me to place that on the show notes? I, I'd be honored, yes. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. Well, it's been wonderful to speak to you, Dr. Marks. Indeed, a, a nerd of your caliber. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic conversation. Thank you very much indeed for coming on the show. Okay, Julian, thank you very much. It was really an honor and it was a lot of fun for me too. <laughs>